Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to uh, Providence Anglican Church and welcome to our Bible study time. We're going to be looking tonight at John chapter 3, and this is actually our second uh, session in John. So I'll do a, a little bit of reviewing <clears throat> about what we've looked at so far, and then we'll tackle some parts of this chapter that we didn't quite get around to last time. But first, let's, uh, let's read together one of the most famous sections of the Gospel. It's Jesus' interview with Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Well, that's quite a bit to start with right there. Notice that Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews, and he is a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a very important man in the political structures of first century Israel. Israel at that time was under the control of the Romans, but they also had a certain amount of uh, autonomy that was allowed them by the Roman government. And uh, so they had a group called the Sanhedrin, and then there were other, uh, there were people within the Sanhedrin that had uh, more or less power than others. And Nicodemus was a ruler within the inner circle uh, of the power structure. He was also a Pharisee. Uh, the Pharisees had a great deal of control over the synagogues. And uh, just to be clear, you have the temple in Jerusalem. Now, in modern times, sometimes uh, synagogues or churches are called temples. But originally, there was only one temple, and that was the true temple where the altar for sacrifice was, where the Holy of Holies was. And um, in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, so uh, the Pharisees did not control that. That was controlled by the high priest and his party. And they were mostly of a group called the Sadducees. The Pharisees were a very conservative uh, Jewish group. They were uh, thoroughgoing supernaturalists. They believed in angels. They believed in demons. They believed in uh, miracles. Whereas the Sadducees seemed to have been uh, a little bit more like our modernistic thinkers, not exactly, not precisely, but they did not have a lot of time for things like angels and uh, that sort of thing. And they also apparently did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, strange for Jews not to believe in that. Uh, but the Pharisees believed completely that there would be a day of resurrection, uh, a day of judgment, and that there was a life after this life. The Pharisees controlled the synagogues in large part. And so Nicodemus is part of this group of Pharisees, very, very Orthodox Jews, thoroughgoing supernaturalists. And he is a leader, and that means he does not merely have religious uh, influence, but the, uh, the leaders that were part of the Sanhedrin and part of the, I think it was called the Council of the Seventy, they had secular power as well. And so Nicodemus is a very important man. Uh, his reputation in secular history is that he was also one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest man in Jerusalem. Now, it says here in verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night. And uh, 
you should know that in John there is a, uh, a thematic element which has to do with light and darkness. And so, uh, well, it could be that Nicodemus is coming at night because it's cooler and a uh, more pleasant time to sit and chat. But in the context, we discover something a bit different. Because this passage that begins in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, draws to a kind of a conclusion in verse 15, but it really carries on a bit further than that. And so I'd like to read you verse 21, which is, I think, the true end of the entire section. Verse 21 says, whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So here is the first time that we meet Nicodemus in the gospel story, according to St. John. Uh, he's named and a specific visit and a specific conversation of his with Jesus is recorded here. He will appear two more times in the gospel story and he will look better as the story progresses. But right here, he is a man who came to Jesus by night in a section which ends with this statement that whoever does what is true comes to the light. And so nighttime is dark time and Nicodemus is very much still in the dark although it seems as the story goes on that he does indeed come into the light. At the very end of the gospel, according to St. John, we find Nicodemus in the daytime helping to give Jesus's body an honorable burial. And this is very important, of course, for people who believe in the resurrection. Um, but the resurrection was coming perhaps a little bit sooner than Nicodemus thought. Here he comes at night and is, in the context, shaded by that decision. But at the very end of the gospel, he comes out into the light. And that gives you a hint that Nicodemus, in all likelihood, uh, came out of the closet. And tradition has it that he did indeed come out and follow Jesus. Well, we continue reading in verse 2, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here in verse 3, you have what seems to be a very um, sharp turn. Nicodemus is still busy, in some sense, buttering up Jesus. But in another sense, Nicodemus is hiding in a second way. First of all, he's hiding because he came at night when no one else would be able to see him coming to talk to Jesus. Um, and yet, uh, hey, he's the only Pharisee who's bothered to seek Jesus out in this way. And so there must be some, uh, some draw for him to come to this meeting. And yet, come, having come to meet Jesus, he not only hides behind the darkness, but he hides behind this word, we. Uh, there's nothing more disturbing, I think, uh, for, a, uh, for a person in an argument to find that their opponent is brought, bringing other people to their side. Statements like, everybody knows. Who are, who is everybody? I, I, I thought I was just arguing with you. Or 
for a husband to hear his wife say, you don't care about us. Oh, wow. That's, that's a tough thing to handle. It's one thing to be opposing your spouse. It's another thing to have the spouse and all of the children uh, aligned against the, the uh, paternal figure of the family. And Nicodemus comes hiding behind his group, that most important group, we might assume. We know. Who are we? Well, it could be the Pharisee sect, could be the Sanhedrin, it could be the inner circle of leaders that Nicodemus is a part of. But whoever the we covers, uh, Nicodemus is not here to stand on his own two feet. He is sheltering himself behind his group identity. And Jesus, it seems to me, has something like a sense of humor. We never see Jesus giggling or twittering in the pages of Scripture, but he employs a wit that um, some of us will find humorous. And so you'll notice that Jesus will answer Nicodemus's royal we with a, a kind of a royal we of his own. Just pause to lighten things up a little bit. Uh, A.W. Tozer was a um, one of the most famous uh, ministers in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. He was sort of the predecessor to Ravi Zacharias. He was the first great, great uh, intellect that the movement had uh, had uh, laid claim to since uh, since the founder A. B. Simpson, the great Presbyterian uh, missions pastor, and uh, Tozer was visiting perhaps Toronto, and uh, the, the the chap picking him up said, "We'll be there to pick you up at uh, such and such a time." And when he showed up, it was only him. And Tozer made the remark that anybody that says we, uh, well, he said nobody has the right to say we when it's only he, unless unless he's got uh, bed bugs. Then he could say, we'll be there to pick you up. Well, Nicodemus is hiding behind the royal we. We know. Jesus seems to break in and kind of cut him off, or at least to answer a question that Nicodemus has not quite asked yet. Um, we should notice, though, uh, from the outset, from verse 2, that uh, this statement that Nicodemus makes, that we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. There's quite a bit uh, in that statement to chew on. One of the problems that uh, modern Christians have, and it's maybe not so much a problem now as it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago, but uh, 20 or 30 years ago, we were in a very anti-supernaturalistic um, era. And people were very skeptical about any claims to the miraculous that they might come across in the scripture. And uh, so there were all kinds of uh, accommodations made to try to make the Bible seem less supernatural than it really was. I uh, reminded of the humorous story of the little girl who came home from Sunday school and she was so excited and her mother said, what are you so excited about? She said, well, she said, God is even greater than I realized. And her mother said, what do you mean? She said, well, in Sunday school today, we learned that it was not the Red Sea that Moses parted but the Sea of Reeds. Oh, said her mother. And she said, and the Sea of Reeds was only a few inches deep when Moses and the Israelites went across it. And her mother 
was again kind of surprised that her daughter would be so excited about this. And she said, well, what's so exciting about that? She said, mommy, don't you see? God drowned the entire Egyptian army in just a couple inches of water. <laughs> Our God is great indeed. Well, uh, yes, uh, I grew up in that era when the supernatural aspects of the Bible were being toned down by uh, people not only in the super liberal uh, parts of the church, but also within some parts of neo-orthodoxy, and even, I'm afraid, within uh, evangelicalism and to some extent Presbyterianism. Um, and, uh, but that was not the case at the time of Jesus. Remember I told you the Pharisees were thoroughgoing supernaturalists. But they weren't stupid people. Um, they were not easily tricked by charlatans. And the miracles that Jesus had done could not be gainsaid. They could not be debunked. They could not be disputed. Uh, the Pharisees, when Jesus had healed the man born blind, had investigated that healing from every possible angle. And although they ended up kicking the blind man who could now see, out of the synagogue, they could not shake loose of his miracle. They had investigated in the community. They had questioned the man time and again, and they had questioned his parents. And his parents had affirmed, we affirm that this is our son. <laughs> so the people who thought he looked like the one that used to sit begging. They were right. Yes, this is the man who was there. He was born blind. We, we can tell you that because uh, we were there when he was born. Mother gave birth to him. But how he was healed of his blindness, they didn't want to get into that because the Pharisees had already um, determined that anyone who acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah would be kicked out of the synagogue and to acknowledge that Jesus had healed this man's eyes would have been tantamount to admitting he was the Messiah because that's the Messiah uh, was supposed to do when he came. That was one of the messianic miracles to make blind eyes see. And so the Pharisees were stuck with that miracle, but that wasn't the only miracle they were stuck with. Remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from a death four days deep and the conclusion of the Pharisees and those who with them wanted to do away with Jesus decided that they needed to get rid of Lazarus as well because so many people were believing on Jesus because of Lazarus and so there were lame men walking and blind men seeing and deaf men hearing who could listen to your questions and demonstrate to you that Jesus had indeed healed them. And, uh, well, we have the written record of it now. It's persuasive, but it's not persuasive to those who refuse to believe in the supernatural. Nicodemus was able to say, we know that you must have come from God because of the great miracles that you've done. And yet that's the opposite of what the rest of the Pharisees were willing to admit in public. Um, but whatever they thought of Jesus, they were stuck with his miracles in a way that modern people um, are not. Jesus jumps right from the statement that he must have come from God to a statement that turns the spotlight on Nicodemus and his chums. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here is 
what Nicodemus and every good Jew was looking toward. They were looking for the kingdom of God. Sincerely or insincere, insincerely, that is what they were supposed to be looking for, longing for, hoping for, for the day when God's kingdom would come on earth. And Jesus tells him that you're not going to be able to see that which everyone supposedly longs to see unless you are first born again. And so here is the phrase for which uh, John is quite famous, and it echoes over and over again in this chapter in different ways. Uh, but it first is telegraphed as much of the rest of the material in John's main body is. It is telegraphed in chapter one where John tells us that Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Well, then he immediately qualifies that by admitting that some of his own did receive him because he says, but as many as did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God children born not in the ordinary way, uh, but born of God. And so in chapter one, you have the expression born of God, used of those who can also be described as those who have received Jesus, those who have believed in his name. Here you have the term born again showing up first here, and you're going to hear it several more times in this first part of chapter three. And we'll look at those as we, as we come to them. But it's the necessary prerequisite for seeing the kingdom of God, for entering the kingdom of God, for experiencing eternal life, according to Jesus. Nicodemus uh, is a uh, teacher himself. And he recognizes um, the language of uh, discussion, and discourse. And he recognizes, I suppose, that Jesus is speaking figuratively. And so he asks him to explain the figure. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, of course, there's not a womb that big. And so uh, Nicodemus, I don't think, is foolish enough to think that that could be what Jesus is talking about. But I think he's trying to bring Jesus out and bring an explanation. So verse 5, Jesus answered, truly, truly, or in the original, amen, amen. Uh, I say to you, uh, and this is a very uh, solemn way of declaring that you are saying something uh, with absolute uh, sincerity and and that it's something of absolute importance truly truly i say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of god and i think jesus might have paused there and looked do you get it now nicodemus does that hint help you because to be born of water and the spirit, that's not two different kinds of births. It's another way of saying born again. To be born again is to be born of water and the spirit. Unless you're born that way, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born of water and the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus explains that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Well, what does it look like to be born again? That will be explained in verse 8. 
The wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now what that means is that there is evidence that will appear um, when someone is born again. But the, the mystery is not able by the evidence to be fully comprehended. The sound of the wind. Um, where I live, uh, the wind sometimes becomes very powerful and it will howl, howl around the eaves and around the door openings. And so it's obvious that the wind is blowing, but I don't know where it came from and I don't know where it's going. I don't know how to stop it. I didn't start it. And the new birth is like that. The only really obvious thing about it is that it is discernible that something has happened. And so just like the sound of the wind, there is um, a consequence that is unmistakable when someone has been born again. And so Jesus in this passage at least has not explained how one is born again. He just explains what it looks like. Nicodemus in verse 9 says to him, how can these things be? Verse 10, Jesus' rebuke. Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Now, remember I told you that when Jesus told him that the new birth was a birth of water and the Spirit, and I said he kind of waited to see any spark of recognition in Nicodemus' eyes, and there was no spark of recognition, there should have been. And Jesus says here, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Well, he's not saying that Nicodemus is a teacher. He is saying that Nicodemus is the teacher. In other words, Nicodemus is the, uh, is the, uh, the master teacher in Israel. He is the teacher of the teachers, the professor of the professors. He's the top dog in the teaching hierarchy. He holds that uh, paramount position. He is the top shelf teacher. And yet he doesn't understand what Jesus implies are very basic rubrics of the kingdom of God. And now notice the language that Jesus picks up. Truly, truly, I say to you, we, notice now that Jesus picks up Nicodemus' royal, uh, royal we, and Jesus picks up his high tone, and he says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you you all do not receive our testimony. And so Jesus is, it seems to me, twisting Nicodemus's tail with his own style of address, picking up what we call in English the royal we. And he says that you do not receive our testimony. You all, that's a plural you, you and your crowd, your lot, y'all, y'all don't accept our testimony. You've come to me and said that we know that you must be a teacher come from God because no one could do these mighty works that you do unless God were with him. But. Come on, Nicodemus, be honest. Y'all do not accept our 
witness. Y'all don't accept our testimony. You're not receiving the teaching that we are giving out. And so drop the pretense. But then in verse 12, he says, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, there are there is so much important material to unpack here that I'm only going to be able to take one piece. There are three Old Testament passages, or perhaps four, that need to be unpacked if we're going to see exactly where Jesus is coming from. Let me just unpack one of them for you tonight, and then we'll finish. And you'll understand that when Jesus implies that Nicodemus, as the star instructor of Israel, should know what he's talking about when he talks about being born again, born of God, born of water and the Spirit, born from above. Nicodemus should understand this new beginning. Well, if he should understand it, then where would he have learned it? Well, you would have to think that he would have learned it in the Bible because he's a Bible man, he's a Bible scholar. And of course, the Bible that they had at that time was the old, what we call as Christians, the Old Testament. But back in those days, it was just the Bible. You had the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then you had the, the historic books, and then you had the books of the prophets, and then you had the wisdom literature. Um, and that is where you would expect that Nicodemus should have been able to find the answer or should have already known the answer to this riddle of the new birth. And so let's just look at one place tonight where he could have discovered it. And that's in Ezekiel chapter 36, where in verse 22, God rebukes the house of Israel and he tells them it's not for their sake that he's going to take action, but it is for the honor of his own name that he's going to take action. Um, God is like a father whose children have messed up, but because they carry his name, the whole family's reputation is at stake. And so the father has to step out and do something. And so Jesus feels, or God, God expresses here that he's going to act for the sake of his own holy name, which they have sullied among the nations. And so uh, their main error has been that their rebuke for here is the, the dabbling in idol worship when they should have stuck to worshiping the true and living God. But now I want you to notice the, the, the main pronoun here, because God is going to do something, and it's all about him. First of all, he says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. So I will, I will, I will gather, I will bring. And then verse 25, here's where we find the water that Nicodemus should have known about. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Okay, I will. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and I will cleanse you. Verse 26, and I will give you a new heart. So when we talk about the new birth, there's a washing. And whenever you get washed, you, you always feel like a new man, don't you? I took a shower and I feel like a new man. 
And so God says, I'm going to wash you. And so there is this new beginning. You're starting out fresh and clean. But then he's going to give them a new heart. Well, that's, that's something really new. I mean, that's not just that they've been scrubbed, but now they have a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to take your hard heart, and I'm going to give you a new heart. And uh, so it's starting to sound like the spiritual bionic man. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the bionic man who had a terrible accident and his body was destroyed. And so they rebuilt him with mechanical parts that made him a kind of a ubermensch. And that's what God is saying. I'm going to make you a spiritual uh, superman. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Now, that's enough for now because what we see here is this is one of the passages that talks about the new covenant, a new arrangement. See, in the old arrangement, the law was written on stone tablets. But this new covenant will involve the law being written on our hearts. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So what was wrong with the old covenant? I had a friend named Zach Jacobs many years ago, and Zach was a Jew for Jesus. And I mean, he was... He was as, as Jewish as a, as a kosher pickle. And, uh, but one of the things that bothered him was the way people would talk about the law and even the way the Apostle Paul seemed to talk about the law in some passages in the New Testament that didn't jibe with Zach's understanding of Scripture because Zach correctly understood that this, the, the law of God is perfect. That's what Psalm 119 says. I mean, what separated Israel from all the other nations, what made them so special was that God had given them his law. And so while the other nations were groping around like blind men, trying to figure out what was right and what was wrong and what was God-like and what wasn't God-like, while they groped along, Israel had it all there on, on, on the scrolls, and on the stone tablets. They had the law of God, which reflected the character of God. So they knew what God was like and they knew what God required. They weren't confused. But there was one problem, which we see in this chapter, which is that they did not keep God's law. He said, you shall have no other gods before me, but they were constantly led astray by the religious allurements of the nations around them, those easy religions with their ritual prostitution and their uh, their uh, seductive uh, techniques of uh, influencing people. And so what is God going to do? He's going to give us a new arrangement in which his spirit is placed inside of us. So the same spirit that inspired the prophets to write God's words down will now be inside of us helping us to obey God's rules, reminding us of what they are, but also giving us the power to do them. This is what Nicodemus should have known. This is the new birth. This is the birth with water and the spirit. And uh, theologians argue about whether baptism is involved in this imagery. And we should say that at the very least, what baptism is emblematic of is certainly here but don't make the mistake of thinking that that uh, that the water and spirit are two different births here no it's all describing this one event of regeneration and there are no steps given here in this section 
in terms of how to be regenerated. But Jesus says you can see it when it happens. A. B. You need it. Implication. You don't have it. And whose work is it? God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And so next time we uh, come back to this passage, we're going to look at Jesus' extended discussion of this when he gives us some idea of how God will bring about this new birth. But I think that's about enough for tonight. It's late here in Jakarta, and uh, sometimes my brain stops mid-sentence when it gets uh, this late, and that wouldn't be good for, for the broadcast if that were to happen this evening. So let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. It is perfect. We thank you for the new covenant, which you brought about through the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. The new covenant that was spoken of in the Jewish scriptures and is therefore as Jewish as Zach Jacobs, as Jewish as Jewish can be, not something created by Gentiles uh, in a later age, but this new birth that Jesus speaks of is the very thing that the prophets wrote about long before. Father, we pray that whatever, if anyone is lacking this new birth, who's listening to the broadcast, that you will send your spirit to blow upon their life and give them that which only you can do. The I will, I will, I will, I will of the Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen.